<laughs> well, hello. How y'all doing today? Doing good? Thank you. Always good to be at the Woodlands, and we're going to help you today. We're going to have fun. We're going to talk about relationships, talk about people. People are everywhere, aren't they? I mean, if you don't like the people at your job, you go to another job, there'll be people there. They're just everywhere. So you might as well learn to get along with them. And it's tough, isn't it? I mean, I'm a, I'm a guy, and I'm married. I told my wife the other day, if you'd really love me, you'd have married somebody else. I mean, it's just hard, you know? Uh, it, it wasn't going well that day. You know, she said, take me somewhere I've never been. I took her to the kitchen. And it just didn't, it, you know, from there, it kind of went downhill. Uh, so, uh, but... Here's what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says? Right at the first of the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 18 says this. For the Lord God said, it is not good to be alone. It's not good to be alone. You read any psychological profile of anybody that does anything strange, weird, perverted, you'll usually see a phrase, this person was a loner, right? A loner. Not good to be alone. You mean strange, weird, maybe even perverted. Uh, Matter of fact, it's especially not good for men to be alone, okay? Uh, look at the research. Single men go into prison and the state hospital a lot more than married guys. So I'm going to encourage you married guys right now. I, I don't know how your marriage is going, but let's look at it in a positive way. It's keeping you out of prison. It's keeping you out of the state hospital. You ought to turn to your wife right now and say, thank you for keeping me out of prison in the state hospital. And one reason she keeps you out of uh, the state hospital, because she'll tell you when you're crazy, right? She'll say, you're crazy. Don't do that anymore. They'll put you in a state hospital. Uh, so we're going to teach you some principles. And we're going to teach you some principles. And, and by the way, this is uh, a series, and we're just going to do one message because we're just here for one time. Uh, so if you want the whole series, you're going to you're gonna have to buy it. I'm sorry. Some of you are a little cheap, but that's the way it is. Uh, <laughs> And uh, just to encourage you to do that, you get this uh, book free if you buy anything back there because my wife's not here and she doesn't believe I work if she's not here. So uh, that'll, be, that'll be good. Uh, but we're going to teach you some principles that work in the long term, not in the short term. Now, now the world's a Ponzi scheme and the world is always trying to get you to do things temporarily. And anybody can get along temporarily, right? I mean, you know, anybody can get along with somebody until you figure out they're not normal. I mean, it takes a while to figure that out, you know? And that urge to merge stage, you know, when one hormone's calling out to another hormone, that, that stage, that, anybody can do that. But I'm talking about relationships that last in the long term. You see, the world's a Ponzi scheme. It's always trying to get you to look at the short term. It always says things like you can have this without that, you know? And, and you can for a while. Unfortunately, by the time the that shows up, you're usually addicted to the this, right? And it has control of you. And so we're talking about long term. See if I can give you a visual so you can understand that. I, uh, I'm in airports a lot because I you know, speak all over the country and I have to fly. My arms get tired. So I, uh, I, I have to get airplanes. And so I'm in airports and and I, I love the airports that have the people movers. You ever seen the people movers? You know, they, they're like escalators on the ground, and they go in the same way you're going. And you can, I mean, it's going, and you're going, and man, it, you know, man, you can make a lot of time. I like those people movers. But it's always, it's usually late at night. It's about 10 o'clock, and there's some ball team of some kind. And it's usually like teenage boys around age 17, you know, somewhere in that, you know, teenage boy around 16 to 18. Uh, it's like their IQ is like plant life. I, I mean, it's like, I mean, you watch at what they do and you think, can an IQ test come back negative? I, I mean, you know, you know I mean, uh, a teenage boys will say something like, well, let's ride on top of the pickup, you know, uh, just stuff like that. They will say things like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to join the Marines, you know. I mean, stuff like that, you know. Uh, that's teenage boys. Right? So there's usually a teenage boy team, and they're in the airport late at night, and they decide to go down the people mover the wrong way. Why? Because they can, and they're young, and they're quick, and, and they can. I mean, I mean, they have to work at it, you know, because it's going this way, and they're going this way, but, you know, they, they, they make progress, you know, they get, they get there, and, and they get, you know, because they're long, they finally, you know, they're just kind of getting to them a little bit, because, I mean, they're, they're going the wrong way, but they, they get to the end. And then they start laughing, you know, about what we did. They don't realize they're still on the people movie, you know. They're, they're laughing, when he, and it's taking them all the way back <laughs> to where they started. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people uh, I've worked with over the years who they 
They believed the Ponzi scheme of the world. They thought they could do just what they wanted to do, and they thought they'd get this pleasure and that pleasure. And then you find them five or ten years later, they've lost their marriage or they lost their job or they're addicted to something. And you realize that the Ponzi scheme of the world is going to do you in if you don't think God's way and look at life God's way. And so we're looking at relationships, not only temporary, but relationships that last. So if you have your Bible, and if you don't, I think we're going to get it on the screen. Uh, and I'm doing it the way Kerry says. So stand up in honor of God's Word. We're going to start with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And it starts off with likewise. Now, whenever you see likewise in the Bible, always think likewise what? Well, if you look in this chapter, in the very first word of that chapter, it also says likewise. So it means about chapter 2. And chapter 2 is all about Jesus. And it's all about how Jesus treated people. So chapter 3 is all about you learning to treat people the way Jesus treated people. You see, if you find Jesus, you'll get to heaven. But if you follow Jesus, you'll have a little bit of heaven down here on earth. Because his principles work in the long term. So it said, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. That means physically she's usually not as strong as the man. I raised three girls, and I always have to open the pickle jar because I'm strong. Feel my muscles. Uh, I believe emotionally women are stronger than men, but this thing is talking about physically. Uh, since they are heirs together with you of the grace of life, in other words, make your wife a partner so that your prayers may not be hindered. God's the one that makes how you treat people contingent on how he treats you. And he makes the way you treat people really an act of worship. Matter of fact, other places in the Bible it says everything you do, you do as unto the Lord. You see, you can't do it for people, you do it as unto the Lord. And then it starts to get more in detail. Finally, all of us, that's all of us, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind. Those are great characteristics in a relationship. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. We'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, I've never met anybody who didn't want to love their life and see good days. Here's how you do it. You keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. You turn away from evil and you do good. You're going to bless people. You seek peace and you pursue it. And then if you do that, the eyes of the Lord are on you and his ears are open to your prayers. Remember it said in another verse, he's not going to answer your prayers. Now he's, his ears are open to your prayers. Isn't that a great life that you're living knowing that God's ears are ready to answer your prayers? And then he says, but the ears are open, his ears are open to his prayer, but the face of the Lord are against those who do evil. Okay, sit down. Uh, let me see if I can explain that verse when it talks about evil, don't do evil back. You see, the way you treat people has to be an act of worship. You cannot keep up the work of relationships unless you see it as an act of worship. And here's the reason. Because people need love the most when they least deserve it. Let me tell you about my wife. When she's in a good mood and things are going well and the grandkids are doing good and there's money in the bank and my schedule's full and people are buying my books, which I'd appreciate you would, uh, <laughs> it's pretty easy to love my wife. But guess what? She doesn't need my love then. You know when she really needs my love? She's in a stinking mood. No money in the bank, schedule's empty, grandkids are messing up, nobody's buying any books. And I say something nice to her, and she says something ugly back to me. That's when she really needs my love. And that's when I really don't want to give it to her. <laughs> I want to say, stick it in your ear, lady. I deserve better than this. But that's when I can do it as an act of worship, as unto the Lord. I love her when she's unlovely. Why? Because God loved me when I was unlovely. I love her when she's a jerkette. Why? Because God loved me when I was a jerk. That's why. You see, she can love me when I'm a jerk. Why? Because God loved her when she was a jerkette. See, we have a higher commitment to our relationship. That's why we've been married over 40 years. That's why we've been married the rest of our life. That's why we grow old, break our hips together. Why? Because we see it as an act of worship. You cannot keep up that work unless you view it that way. Now, humanly, and that's why it has to say contrary, we want to return evil for evil. That's our Adam suit. You know, remember, we all come to Adam's family. We, you do evil me, I want to do evil back. Oh, when I bless you, I actually want you to bless me back. So let me see if I can uh, explain this to you. What's your name? 
Cameron, let's just say I decide I'm going to bless Cameron. I mean, I've always given him a book already. I mean, I'm just <laughs> blessing him. I'm blessing Cameron. Bless, bless Cameron. Man, I just got up this morning to bless Cameron. And I see me blessing him. Bless, bless, bless. Man, I'm blessing Cameron. <laughs> Man, bless Cameron, bless Cameron. See me, I'm blessing Cameron, boy. Bless, bless, bless. Getting a little tired, but I'm blessing, blessing, blessing. You know, i am got a few more blesses, bless, 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 you know. But then after a while, I start thinking, now when's Cameron going to bless me back? And I start thinking things or thoughts like this. After all I've done for Cameron... Don't look at me like you don't think like this, okay? I'm a shrink. I know how you think, you know. Uh, and you start getting resentful, you see, wanting somebody to bless you because you've blessed them. But you know what this scripture says? You're not blessing them so they can bless you back. You're blessing them so God can bless you back, you see. People are always going to let you down. Matter of fact, uh, let me see if I can explain it so you can understand it. You cannot see the emotional, but you, you can see the physical. Uh, I had an abscess tooth one time. I think it's the most pain I've ever been in. I, I mean, I, I'd take a step in it like it would throb. Now, when I had that abscess tooth, was I thinking of somebody else? No. I was thinking only of myself. How can I get relief? How can I, how can I you know, it was all about me. You will run into people in your life who are abscessed emotionally. They're in so much pain, they can only think of themselves. Matter of fact, I, I almost can guarantee you there's at least one person in your family, because every family tree has a sap. <laughs> there's at least one uh, in your family that's abscessed emotionally. And no matter how much you bless them, they're never going to bless you back. But don't allow those people to make you miserable. Don't allow those people to control your life. Because God's the one that's going to bless you. God's going to take care of you. You see, if he can get good out of the cross, which is the worst thing anybody could do to somebody, make it the best thing for everybody, then the cross is the biggest plus sign in your life. And no matter what they do, God's going to say, I'm going to bless you. And that's the only way to keep up that behavior. You have to bless them knowing that that's why you were called, so that you will obtain a blessing from God. So how do we, how do, we do this? And let me put this into practice. And we're going to use the word lover. And, and you've heard me preach before, so you know I'll never get through it. But that's just the way it is. We'll just do the best we can. Uh, and so L stands for learn. You have to learn how to love people. Everybody's loved in a different way. And so you have to learn by entering their world. You see, the only way you know God loves you is he left his world and entered your world. And the only way people are going to know you love them is if you're willing to enter their world. Well, how do you do that? You have to do that through communication because we're all so different. I mean... Men and women are just different. I, uh, see, my wife grew up learning how to communicate, learning how to cooperate. That's what girls do. They, they talk. They communicate. Boys, we compete. You know, king of the hill, capture the flag, put a helmet on and seriously injure the other guy. That's how we grew up, you see, that competition. And women sometimes have a hard time understanding that part of our personality. My wife and I went on one of our first vacations, and she says, can we stop at the rest area? And I said, not till I pass that Chevrolet. <laughs> she said, what Chevrolet? I said, the Chevrolet passed me 30 miles back. I've been trying to catch ever since. That Chevrolet. You see, that's hard for a man to stop at a rest area and let all those cars pass him that he'd had to pass before. <laughs> see, See, w men are in the competition. We're in the simple things. You see, women are more complex. Men are just simple. I mean, I, I think I go to bed, one head, one bed, one pillow. Right, guys? Wrong. I'm married. So I take seven pillows off every night. I put seven pillows back on every morning. Why? I don't have a clue why. Why? <laughs> Because it wasn't good for man to be alone. He needed more pillows, I guess, you know. Uh, uh, but, th but that's where we are. So you have to learn to communicate. So, men, I'm going to help you a little bit. Now, uh, in the series, I actually teach men how to listen. But I I'm just going to do the first two steps with you today because I don't have much time. But these first two steps will help you guys, I promise you. And the first step is 
You've got to pick on nonverbal communication. Women talk for rapport as much as they talk for report. Women talk as much for process as they do for product. So you have to focus on the nonverbal communication. So when a woman wants to talk to you, you have to put everything down, all right? You have to put the computer down or the iPhone down and lean forward and look her in the eyes, all right? Because you've got to learn to pick up on nonverbal communication. If you come home and your wife's in the kitchen in a position somewhat like this, and you say, what's wrong, honey? And she says, nothing. And you say, oh, good, I'm going to go play golf. Uh, then you will soon see Jesus, you know, because uh, she's going to kill you. Uh, because non-verbally, she's telling you everything is wrong, and if you loved me enough, you'd hang around and find out. You see, that's non-verbal communication. So to pick up on that, you have to put things down. Look her in the eye. Now, when she talks, then you are to listen. And most of you, and remember, that's just the first two steps. Most of you then don't know what to say. And after she pauses, so I'm going to help you right here. These first two steps will be a great progress for some of you. Put everything down, lean forward, look her in the eye, and say, tell me more. Okay, that's all you got to do. All you got to do, guys. Surely you can do that. Okay? Now, I have to balance this out a little bit, and I really hate to tell you, but I'm committed to the truth, and so it's ugly, but I have to, I have to tell you because it's the truth. When a man leans forward, looks you in the eyes, and says, tell me more, he doesn't really want to know anymore. <laughs> hate to tell you that, but he's a guy, all right? He's a guy, you know? So when he does that, he's doing it because he loves you, and, and he loves Jesus, and I told him to, okay? So when he does that, keep it short, Okay? He does not want the whole paper. He wants the front page. You see? Uh, one guy said, does it bother you that your wife has the last word? He said, no, I'm just excited when she gets to it. And so uh, <laughs> you, got, you got to learn to communicate. The only way to learn how to love people is, is to communicate. Now, here's, here's another key with, with communications. You have to learn to share your expectations in advance of anything that happens. You cannot do it in the event itself. I'm going to teach you a word, and the word is psychological, all right? But I'm going to break up into two words, psycho and logical, all right? Uh, Many of your communication is psycho. Why? Because you wait to the event itself and the emotions take over. Now, when the emotions take over, there's a part of the brain called the amygdala that kind of gives sign to shoot out adrenaline and all kind of stuff, and the blood goes to the muscles, which physically you can do big stuff. You know, you, can, you probably heard of people picking up cars or something because the adrenaline got going in the emotion of the event. Uh, but the blood does not go to the brain. It goes to the muscles, okay? So you're going to be psycho in your communication if you do it during the event itself. So let me give you some visuals so you can understand that. Let's just say it's been a long winter, and it's his first spring day. And the guy goes to the garage, and he sees his golf clubs, and he's thinking, man, I haven't played golf all winter. Man, it's been a brutal winter. But, man, Saturday I noticed it's going to be a perfect day. I mean, man, I'm going to call my buddy Saturday at 10 o'clock. I'm going to tee off. Man, it's going to be a great Saturday. Now, this is Tuesday, all right? He's looking in the garage. He sees his golf clubs. A few minutes later, he leaves, and the wife goes into the garage. He says, man, this garage is a wreck. Wow, man, the winter, man, we just pile stuff in here. But I know Saturday... It's going to be a beautiful day. What a great day for a family cleanup, to clean up the whole garage. Man, start about 10 o'clock. We can finish in time, you know, that after. And, okay, this is Tuesday. Now, if they had talked about it 
before Saturday, before the expectations, it could be logical. I mean, she could say, you know, I, we got to clean up this crowd. He said, man, I know, but man, I really needed to, I hadn't played golf all winter. Can I, it, well, I, I tell you what, I, I can play early. I, I'll, I'll go off at eight o'clock. I'll be back about 1230. I tell you, at 130, we can start cleaning out the garage. The whole family, man, we'll make it a project. We'll all work hard. And then five o'clock, I'll take everybody to go eat to celebrate. We got the garage. I mean, they could work it out on Tuesday. But if they wait until Saturday at 10 o'clock when he goes to get his golf clubs, it will be psycho. You know what I mean? It will be psycho. Why? Because it, it, the emotions take over. I had, this, uh, I had this couple in Dallas, and they were having psycho communication every time he came home from work. So they come in for marriage counseling, and I've, I've been in lots of fights, so I break them up. I see the wife first, and then I see the husband. So I told the wife... What are your expectations when your husband comes home from work? Okay, I'm trying to get to logical communication before the event happens. Uh, and she says, well, I, I wish that he could help me with these kids. I'm just exhausted. But I said, well, have you ever asked him for help? So well, we just end up fighting. And come to find out what happens is she's exhausted. She says, daddy's home. And the kids run to the door. Well, daddy's in commercial real estate, all right? At the time, he was making tons of money in Dallas. Everybody was, it's like Monopoly. They're just going around getting the money. It, it ended up like Monopoly too. They got the go to jail card. But at the time, uh, and this guy, he had real Italian suits, designer handmade Italian suits. I mean, like $5,000 suits. That's what he wore to work. Now, I mean, my coat says dry clean only, but he had real people's names in it. I mean, you know. Uh, and so he would come home and she would say, Daddy's home, and the kids would rush to the door. And you know what preschool kids carry around. I mean, it's kind of gross, but they'd get stuff all over these $5,000 suits. He'd get mad, and he'd throw one down. The other one would jump on him, and he'd get mad, and, throw, and then he'd get mad. And it was psycho every, day, every afternoon when he came home from work. So she said, I just need some help with these kids. I said, okay, okay. So I, I, I bring the husband in. Uh, I let the wife go out and bring the husband in. I said, what are your expectations when you come home from work? And he said, well, you know, I know she needs help with these kids. And then that's when he talked to me about his suit and everything. He said, if she could just give me 15 minutes... Not announce that I'm home so I could come around and sneak in the back, take off my work clothes, put on something like a rubber suit that I could hose down. Uh, <laughs> then I would love to help her with her kids. I know she's exhausted. I know she needs help. I said, have you ever told her that? He said, no, we just fight about it. I said, because it's psycho. I said, I'm going to bring her back in, and you're going to logically explain to her how you can help her if she will do what you ask her to do. So she comes back in. He looks her in the eyes. He goes through the whole thing, you know, the rubber suit, the whole deal. And he says, if you'll just give me 15 minutes, I'll help you with these kids. She looks back at him and smiles and says, if I know you're going to help me, I'll give you 30 minutes. If I can see the light at the end of the tunnel and I'm going to get some help, I I'll give you. We literally solved their problem in 25 minutes. Now, I charge them for the full hour. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're good, get the money, right? You know, and so... Uh, so we have to learn how to do that. You see, you have to learn how to do that. Okay, now, O. O stands for overlook. Notice what the scripture says. You don't return evil for evil. People are going to do some things to you that irritate you, all right? But you can overlook those. What happens is, when, back when I was practicing, people would come to me, and I couldn't believe the things they were fighting over. I mean, the little things that people fight over, uh, this one lady, she, she had a, a teenage son, and she went to work one day and told him, uh, could you just put the clothes in the dryer? You know, that's the only thing you had to do, put the clothes in the dryer. She comes home from work, and the kid forgets to put the clothes in the dryer. And she said she just went ballistic. I mean, she just started hollering. And, Can't you do anything? One thing I ask you to do is put the clothes in the dryer. I mean, she just went off, you know. Some mothers can actually put their mouth in gear and go off and leave it. I mean, you know, they just kept, you know, she just kept going, kept going. And finally, he interrupted her and said, Mom, can I ask you a question? She said, what? He says, when you're up at the church talking to your friends, and they say, my son's on drugs. Others say, you know, my, my daughter's on drugs. Others say, you know, my son's an alcoholic. Others say, you know, my, my son's in prison. Others say, you know, my daughter's pregnant. We don't know what we're going to do. Do you say, that's nothing. My boy forgets to put the clothes in the dryer. 
She said, all of a sudden, I started to see that I get so upset over little things. I uh, look back over my life, and I think, man, why did I get so upset about that? It didn't matter. That, you know, now he, we first moved to Dallas. Uh, I started a counseling center for the First Baptist Church Dallas, one of the first big psychological counseling centers that, that a church had started. So I was only there, you know, a couple of months, and uh, we met some friends, and they wanted to take us out to lunch after church. So I gave my girls, I told them, I want, I want you to be on time today. We, we would always meet at a certain location, but we're going out to eat with some friends, so everybody be on time. I gave them the on time speech, and, uh, and everybody was on time except my teenage daughter, Angela, you know, you, you teenagers, you know, you just put them to bed normal, they wake up weird. It just happens. And so uh, five minutes late, no Angela. Ten minutes late, no Angela. Finally, one couple says, look, the restaurant's going to be crowded. Why don't we go ahead and save a table? And I said, thank you. That'd be nice. Other couple said, look, we know you're new, Dallas. You don't know the way. We will wait, and you can follow us to the restaurant. I say, thank you for saving a table. Thank you for waiting. And underneath my breath, I thought, I'm going to kill her when she gets here. <laughs> Fifteen minutes late, Angela just bebops up. You know how teenagers are. Hey, Dad, how's it going? And by then, as King James would say, I am ticketh off. I, am, uh, I have lost the joy of Jesus. But I'm the psychologist at the largest church in the world at the time. So if you're the psychologist, you can't holler at your kids in church. So you have to develop the fine art of hollering with your mouth closed. So I said, Angela, where are you then? She said, I've been to Sunday school. I said, no, you have not. You're 15 minutes late. Tell me where you've been. I've been to school. Why are you so late? I'm going to tell you. Calm down. Tell me now. She said, Dad, it's an all-girls class. We wear Sunday shoes. They're very uncomfortable. We take them off before we put them on. Uh, we take them off, and then we put them back on after Sunday school because they're so uncomfortable. But this time, somehow, the boys got in during break time and stole our shoes and hit them. It took us 15 minutes to find our shoes. And then I say what parents say. I call them parental stupidisms. They're things that make no sense whatsoever, but they feel good when you say them. So I said, Angela, don't you ever take your shoes off again as long as you live. <laughs> makes no sense, but it feels good. You know, all parents have them. You know, a parent will look at a kid in the tree and say, you fall out of that tree and break your leg. Don't you come running to me. Every generation has them, by the way. My mom used to say this, don't run around with that stick. You'll poke your eye out. And I tried to tell her one time, you can't poke your eye out. Maybe you could poke your eye in, but the only way to poke your eye out would be to take your stick and I gotta pop it out like that. And I was grounded for like six months. So you just have to put up with parents when they do it. You know, it's part of it. So I am mad. We get in the car. We're following the McCulloch family because I don't know the way the restaurant. They drive a gray Buick. One of our girls goes with them. One of their girls goes with us. It, it helps somehow. It spreads out the misery something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so everybody's laughing, going out to eat, got new friends, but I am mad. <laughs> got to follow this gray Buick. <laughs> And then somebody in the car said, did the McCulloughs get a new car? And I look at that car, and the McCulloch kid said, did we get a new car? You know, like they got it in Sunday school or something. And then somebody said, that's a Cadillac. And the McCulloch kid said, did we get a Cadillac? And then the McCulloch kid said, that, I don't think that's my family. And everybody in the car immediately realized, dad is following the wrong car, but do not say a word because he could kill you. So once everybody realized that, our car just shut down, not a word out of anybody, just total silence looking, you know, what's going to happen now? Well, everybody in the car but one 
my youngest daughter, Brianne, was only seven at the time. Now, let me tell you a little bit about child development. Kids under about the age of eight do not have a normal brain. They have a memorex brain, which means they just repeat what they hear at the worst possible time. <laughs> don't say anything in front of a kid under age eight. You don't want repeat it at the worst possible time. One kid, every time he saw his grandpa, says, Grandpa, make a noise like a frog. Grandpa, make a noise like a frog. And every time he see, Grandpa, make a noise like a frog. And finally, Grandpa said, I'm sick of this. Every time you see me, say, make a noise like a frog. You know, why do you do that? And the little kid said, Grandma said, when you croaked, we're going to Hawaii. Uh, so, uh, so be careful what you say in front of kids, all right? So everybody in the car over age eight, shut it down, not a word. But Brianne is seven. She doesn't have a normal brain. So she starts laughing. <laughs> Isn't this funny, everybody? Isn't this funny? I mean, Angela lost her shoes, but dad's lost the whole car. <laughs> well, I pulled over because I didn't know who I was following anyway, and I apologized to my daughter. But learn to overlook. Learn to overlook. Matter of fact, I preached a message very similar to this in uh, Arkansas. A guy was at the book table, standing in line. I could tell he wanted to talk to me. He got there and he said, uh, said that sermon was for me. He said, I have an intense personality and I have a hard time overlooking things. He said, my wife and I got married. It seemed like every time I went to the bathroom, there was no toilet tissue. Just that cardboard cylinder staring me in the face. He said, I told her, can't you change the toilet tissue? She acted like it was no big deal. She changed the toilet tissue. She said as much as I did, but it was a big deal to me. He said, from then on, every time I found one of those cardboard cylinders, I would take it off, and I would write the date and the time when I found them, and I started saving them in a big black plastic bag waiting for toilet tissue to come up in the conversation because now I had proof. He said a few months passed and conversation came up. We talked about toilet tissue. And I said, lady, you never change a toilet tissue as much as me. She said, oh, yes, I do. He says, oh, no, you don't. And I have Proof. And he ran and got his big black plastic bag. He said, I started dumping those cardboard cylinders out. They were bouncing everywhere, and I started screaming at my sweet wife, there's a date and a time on every one of them, lady. I got proof. Said she, her eyes got big. She started looking at those cardboard cylinders bouncing everywhere. She picked up one and saw the date and the time, and she looked up at me and said, you're sick. <laughs> but I couldn't let it go. I said, I'll show you who's sick and it made an appointment with a psychologist he said I carried my big black plastic bag I looked like Santa Claus going to see the psychologist he said the psychologist said how can I help you he said I'll tell you how I got a lady right here that's never changed a toilet tissue as much as I have I got proof he said I started dumping them on the psychologist he said they're bouncing all over the psychologist's desk I was screaming at him he looked at me and looked at those cardboard cylinders and says you're sick carry these around sometimes. <laughs> you know the reason I carry them around? Because I'm sick. <laughs> I'll tell you another reason I carry them around. Because you're sick. You got within you just what's within me. The ability to get downright angry over stuff that other people do. That in the big scheme of things do not matter. Matter of fact, I was back east. I was preaching in one of those uppity churches back east. I speak in a lot of those uppity churches, and I have a calling, kind of a special calling, and one of those callings is to destroy the dignity of uppity churches. Uh, I mean, that's what Jesus would do if he was here, and I'll just do it for him. And so uh, I go to these uppity churches. So I was in this uppity church, and it was I mean, everything is uppity. I mean, they have uppity songs. They dress uppity. It's just all uppity. And so I thought that'd be a good place to tell my toilet tissue story, you know. Uh, 
Well, the pastor in those uppity churches doesn't go sit down anywhere. He sits in a big old chair up on the platform. You might have seen some of those uppity churches. And, and actually, I have a chair too. I don't get to go back there. I got to go sit in my uppity chair after it's all over. So I could tell he was not liking the toilet tissue story. So the sermon ended, and I had to go back to my uppity chair. And, of course, the pastor's right there, and I can tell he's angry. You know, his veins are a little red-faced. And I thought, well, I'm going to take it to the next level. So in front of a whole crowd of people, I handed him my toilet tissue. I said, here's a little memento of me being in your church. And I handed it to him, and he took that thing, and he slammed it into his pocket. And his veins got bigger. And I thought, well, what I really thought was, do I have the check yet? Uh, but uh, <laughs> and he was mad. Well, we left that uppity church. You got to go downstairs to get out of those uppity churches. So we went downstairs, and the door closed, and he turned to me. And his anger started to drain out of his face. And he said, I think you could tell I was a little upset on the platform. And I said, yeah, it doesn't, don't have to be a psychologist to spot those veins coming out like that. Uh, <laughs> he said, you won't believe what happened this afternoon. He said, uh, I've been married 35 years. My wife and I got in one of the biggest fights we've ever been in this afternoon, about two hours before church. And it was over toilet tissue. And I thought she called you and told you about it. <laughs> I don't know what you uh, fight about at your house. But let me tell you, I doubt if it's worth it. Matter of fact, think about it this way. God, because of Jesus Christ, has chosen to overlook everything you've ever done or will do. All he asks is that you overlook the things in other people's lives. And then he says, you will love your life and you will see good days. And my ears will be open to your prayers. Now, we don't have time to finish. I got, I'm already, I've done already. O stands for overlook. V stands you got to value what you have instead of other people's, what they have. You've got to learn to encourage people, be an encouragement. Matter of fact, you guys, what you could do is you could say, man, I, I think we really need help. So let, let's get that marriage series and let's listen to it in the car. You know, I'd be a better husband. She would fall over, but then that would uh, be a, a, an encouragement to her. And then R stands for realize what's really important in life. You say, how do you know what's important in life? Well, you have to live life by direction, not by distraction. You see, if you go to the grocery store, I mean, I know what I want to, when I get to the grocery store. I'm supposed to get grapes and bananas, and at my age, my wife says I need fiber, which means I'm going to live five years longer, but four years will be in the bathroom, so I'm not really sure what that <laughs> does. But I know what I'm supposed to get at the grocery store, but I, when I get there, there's Twinkies and Ding Dongs and Snickers and ice cream. And if I'm not careful, I'll get to check out and realize I wasted a lot of money and spent a lot of time on stuff I really didn't want or need in the first place. And that's the way it is with your life. One day you can come to the end of your life, you're going to come to check out. If you're not careful, you'll look back and realize you wasted a lot of time, spent a lot of money on stuff you really didn't want or need in the first place. You say, what's important in life? People. That's the only thing that matters. What do you do? You learn to bless them. You love them. Most of you met my wife, Penny. She's a classy lady. She likes classical music. I, uh, I don't get classical music. I said, if that if is that good, they get some words to go with it. So I, I don't like classical music. I like country music. She says that's an oxymoron, country music. It doesn't go together. And some of it is pitiful, isn't it? I mean, uh, my wife ran off my best friend, and I miss him. You know, that's just not, not good. Uh, <laughs> but there was one years ago that went something like this. The greatest man I never knew lived just down the hall. And every day we said hello, though we never touched at all. He was in his paper and I was in my room. How was I to know he thought I hung the moon? The greatest man I never knew, I guess I'll never know. He never had too much to say. Too much was on his mind. And now it seems so sad that everything he gave us took all he had. The days turned to years, the memories to black and white, and he grew cold like an old winter wind that blew across my life. The greatest words I never heard, I guess I'll never hear. The man I thought would never die has been dead almost a year. Well, he was good at business, but there was business left to do. He never said he loved me. I guess he thought I knew. 
My friend, God made perfectly clear at Calvary. Jesus, with outstretched hands, said, It is finished. He finished the business of loving you. And he's given you the business of loving others. Primarily the people in your family. The big question in your life is a simple question. How's business? How's loving people? It's the only business that really matters. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you that you're such a good God and you're our God because of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you loved us unconditionally and that you overlooked everything in our life. Teach us, Lord, not to return evil for evil, but to do good and to bless those people so that we will be able to love our life and see good days and because we know that you will answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.